we are, um, won't be having a speakers program uh, in July. We put out a lot of, uh, reached out to a number of museums and historical societies. They all appear to be booked for that month. We didn't get any responses. Uh, and then in August, we will have, on August the 14th, we want to welcome you all to the annual Vines and Vittles Festival, which will be on August the 14th in Webb Park. So we'll be, the speakers will be on hiatus for that one. Uh, we will be resuming in September. I ask you to keep. We already got a, what, a commitment from one speaker, Richard Carrico, an archaeologist and historian who has given some entertaining talks in the past. He committed for October, so we got October. And uh, keep the, stay tuned in, in our ads and in the coverage in the newspapers and uh, on the society website, uh, rbhistory.org, for the latest updates on that series. For today, as many of you are aware, in addition to the volunteer work I, Peggy and I do for the Society, we still have day jobs as uh, in doing research. I'm a, a journalist and researcher with a special interest in history. Peggy and I both co-own a company which specializes in family history research. And a few years ago, we were approached by a colleague and sometime client for family, past family history projects named Everett Ireland, who was a resident of Rancho Leonardo at that point. And he engaged us to write about the lab where he spent all of his working life, from his as a young man getting out of college in Wisconsin in the uh, late 40s to his retirement in the 70s. Well, actually, he worked there through 71, and then he worked at a couple of other facilities for reasons we'll go into. But he spent most of his working life at what became Naval Ordnance Laboratory Corona. And Everett felt that the lab had done some good work which wasn't getting proper recognition. <coughs> good work for the country wasn't getting proper recognition. And so uh, we agreed. Unfortunately, uh, poor health prevented him from being more directly involved in the writing of the book. That task basically fell to me. But I was able to do that. In the process, I learned the story of, of a lab which not only did important work for the nation's military, but in many ways laid the foundation for the digital revolution that's transformed and continues to transform our society. And uh, that's what we'll be taking up. Our slideshow gives a brief summary of the career of that lab. My, the book is called From Measures to Missiles because the lab had its origins originally in the need to maintain standards of weight and measurement for the government. Now, so who's checking? <laughs> Many of us don't pay too much attention to standards of weight and measurement. We reflexively fill our gas tank or buy a pound of ground beef at the grocers without thinking about how accurate the gas pumps are or the meat package labels are. But the existence of such standards is how most societies and most national governments are able to function, at least since the time of the Industrial Revolution, which is both the times of both the scientific and industrial revolutions were times when governments and societies began to find ways to more systematically set up certain standards. And um, among and the US government was no exception to that as it was getting started. Among the 18 powers assigned to the United States Congress by the U.S. Constitution in 1789 was this one, to coin money, I'm sorry, regulate the value thereof and the foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures. This is from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5. From the various, the origins of the country from 1830 to about 1901, U.S. standards were overseen by the Office of Weights and Measures in the United States Treasury Department. But then, seeking to organize this such standards even better, in 1901, a new agency was created within the Commerce Department called the National Bureau of Standards. This is an uh, excerpt from an article in the Washington, D.C. newspaper from March of 1901, announcing the creation of the Bureau. Uh, the first director was um, Mr. Samuel Stratton, 
He was, at the time, a 40-year-old physics professor at the University of Chicago when President William McKinley appointed him to be the first director of what would come to be known as NBS. And I will point out, uh, Mr. Stratton would serve for 21 years under four presidents, both Democrats and Republicans. This is a precedent that would remain for another four decades as far as directors and other uh, officials of the National Bureau of Standards were concerned. Uh, the idea was that the director of NBS uh, was a professional rather than a political position. And presidents generally respected that up to a certain point, as we'll find out. This is a shot of the first NBS headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C. Um, from 1901. And it included, of course, laboratories housing instruments for measurement. I, noted, I remember seeing a picture of one of the first instruments was the original meter, iron meter bar, an iron bar a meter long, exactly a meter long, which was the standard for metric measurement until they began to find ways to use light waves to make similar measurements. And that's partly a reflection of the continuing work, theoretical and practical work being done by the members of the Bureau as uh, Director Stratton and other members uh, engaged in conferences in the US and around the world among scientists everywhere to always find new ways of or engaging in theoretical and practical work to better organize uh, standards. This is an early um, list of division and section chiefs. This is how the Bureau was organized. Like you see here, this is a division of weights and measures, and we'll leave it below that sections on comparison of capacities, weights and measures, system, heat and thermometry, light and opti optical instruments, uh, under which you have uh, sections on spectroscopy, magneto optics. Here, notice this computer. This is as of July the 1st, 1905. And as far as I know, this would have been some sort of early mechanical adding machine kind of thing. I mean, the need to do complex computations would, had arisen, and it would soon lead to the creation of the mainframe computer and other computers as we know it today. But, at that, but they were already using the term. I should also point out, um, this was from one of the books that I used and, and that Everett pointed out to us for reference, a book called Measures for Progress, which was published in the late 1950s, which was essentially like a half century history of the Bureau. Um, well, it included, you know, as I say, appendices for each year of the Bureau. But since it was published in the 1950s, it indicates the tenure of some of these people. Here you have Dr. Director Stratton, served from 1901 to 1922. There are a number of other section chiefs here who clearly had tenures of 20 to 30 years. Again, this was a reflection of them being looked upon as professionals. And this, and one of the other things, uh, Stratton and the people under him worked to recruit the best talent that they could find and encourage it. Now, working for a government agency and trying to get money out of a very conservative Congress was not always, uh, it, they were not always able to uh, duplicate what jobs of similar positions could offer, like in business and academia. One thing they did offer was civil service protection and the prestige of working under people like uh, Samuel Stratton. This, this uh, particular um, uh, list of, of, this was like a couple of pages. This list would soon grow and it would be like multiple pages by uh, the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, an example of the demands that were being made on the Bureau and uh, because the Bureau was not technically a regulatory body. It did perform experiments and test certain kinds of products at the request of other government agencies like the uh, trade, Federal Trade Commission or the Post Office Department. But in, it, that work often overlapped with consumer demands, and it would overlap in many ways, and there, there are many events which led to that. And here's an example. 
This is a photograph of the aftermath of the Great Baltimore Fire of 1904. What happened was, in February of 1904, a huge fire broke out in downtown Baltimore, Maryland. And what, was, what happened was that this blaze, blaze spread to consume, it took 30 hours to burn out and consumed more than 1,500 buildings over 70 city blocks. And that happened because fire companies that were called in to help, like from Washington, D.C. and other places in Maryland, when they got there, they discovered that their hoses wouldn't fit Baltimore hydrants. And uh, the uh, chief of the Baltimore Fire Department uh, spoke out against this, saying we could have flooded the burning district if there had been nozzles enough. But as it happened, many of the firefighters found themselves helpless because the equipment didn't in sync. And this is an example of where standards have, there's a practical need here to maintain standards. For several years previous to the fire, organizations representing fire companies and fire insurance company underwriters had been, insurance underwriters, had been advocating uniform hose coupling standards. And one of the agencies that assisted them in this was NBS, which commissioned a study by its engineering instrument section. And by the time that investigation concluded, they discovered there were over 600 sizes and variations in fire hose couplings <clears throat> collected across the country. And that was sort of simultaneous with this, but this disaster helped to put a real focus on the need for more uniform hose coupling standards. And pretty soon, the NBS was involved in other investigations in fields from railroad safety and construction materials to food preparations. These efforts coincided with a wave of government reforms, like the passage of the food, Pure Food and Drug Act, we're talking about the early 1910s, and uh, uh, anti-monopoly legislation. As a result of these uh, regulatory requirements, the, uh, the national profile of NBS as a sort of a national scientific clearinghouse, or the nation's laboratory, as some people began to call it, grew. With the demands for services growing, the Bureau was soon adding laboratories and other research facilities, uh, moving its headquarters from downtown Washington to a more open space near the Maryland state line. This is a picture of some of the new buildings on the campus in 1911. Uh, the Bureau, uh, this less populated area in D.C. allowed the room for the erection of more buildings. The Bureau had grown to almost 300 employees by 1911 and continued to grow exponentially. It would also begin adding field, what were called field stations in other cities. This is a picture of the Pittsburgh Kiln House. This was a house a facility set up in the early, in the 1911-1915 period to help develop optical glass. Optical glass was a higher quality of glass that was used that needed, was needed for instruments like microscopes and was also beginning to be used in more better developed eyeglass wear. But at that point in time, optical glass was made exclusively in Germany. And uh, this was some, another reason for efforts by NPS to try to develop uh, domestic capacity to produce things like optical glass, especially as when the World War I broke out in Europe in 1914, the U.S. wasn't involved directly yet, but we were facing situations where strategic materials, like optical glass, had not been available for U.S. manufacture. Um, so, the, uh, so the Pittsburgh Field Station was an example, and I mentioned testing the building materials, and we see examples of the facilities that NBS began to create. Here's test, testing equipment for buildings and highways. This is an Emory testing machine. This was a 2,300,000 pound machine, which was designed for exhaustion tests of beams, girders, and other large metal structural components. They basically were testing building materials here. And um, on the right here is an Olsen machine, for, which was set up at the Pittsburgh uh, field, uh, station for testing uh, piers and other masonry columns. So, um, and then uh, there was also 
This is a picture from 1919 showing MBS employees at the NDC and other facilities creating uh, manufacturing gauge blocks. Gauge blocks are standardized blocks of basic lengths and thicknesses which are used for precision manufacturing. And um, one of their most important uses also is in use of ordnance. Um, there was a statistic from Measures for Progress, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around, saying construction of a single round of artillery ammunition required gauging of 80 dimensions, necessitating the use of over 500 different gauges. So they needed a lot of gauges. <laughs> And uh, both for manufacturing and for ordnance. And I mentioned this because the need for uh, tools and precision instruments for ordnance began to play a bigger and bigger part in the operations of the National Bureau of Standards. And also entailed, this kind of work entailed recruiting, uh, along with uh, scientists like physicists and engineers of various kinds. Uh, you saw all kinds of inspectors, uh, all kinds of craftspeople, tool makers, uh, inspectors, uh, technical assistants and administrative aides. Again, uh, Stratton and his uh, people working under him worked to tap into the best talent in business and academia, and also reaching down into technical and uh, vocational schools as well as college campuses in the country to recruit the best talent, to get the best minds. And uh, they were doing work involving all sorts of developing technologies. And here's another example. The first uh, wind tunnel built in 1918 at NBS, and it was under the direction of this gentleman, Lyman Briggs. Uh, this tunnel, as I said, was completed in 1918. At that point in time, to give you an idea of the state of aviation technology, it had a nine-foot propeller, which produced air speeds of 90 miles an hour. But that was as fast as airplanes were getting in those days. The Beerus Tunnel was built under the supervision of Dr. Lyman Briggs. Lyman Briggs, and this is a typical case, he'd been a physicist at the Department of Agriculture studying soil aspects of soil composition, when the department agreed to, quote, lend him to NBX. And you see a lot of that, if reading a lot of the materials, about that history. You read about various departments, various companies and labs lending scientists and engineers to NBS, and then eventually they would become permanent employees. They might come to study some particular relevant aspect. They'd be tapping into their expertise, and then pretty soon they would build maybe a section around it in order to do further work. Uh, another man who assisted Lyman Briggs, the young man named Hugh Dryden, this is a picture of him at the D.C. wind tunnel complex in 1818. Dryden was only 19 years old when he came to work, but he was already a college graduate. He earned a degree in physics in only three years. He was pursuing his doctorate in physics and mathematics when he went to work at NBS. He would become one of the leaders in NBS in aerodynamics research, and we'll hear more about him as we proceed. Aerodynamics was an important part of uh, the research that uh, NBS was doing, and this is an example. This is another piece of equipment that they had in DC, an altitude chamber. What you're looking at, this is a, an aircraft engine. From This is from um, 1918, and this was described as a Liberty engine, which was a basic engine that was used in a lot of the, at that point, biplanes, interceptors that were uh, being developed at that point. And it's been put inside this chamber where they, with two concrete doors. And what they do is the uh, engine would be encased in the concrete and it had, uh, it was refrig electrical refrigerating machinery and vacuum pumps, which were designed to duplicate high altitude uh, temperatures and pressures. So this sort of equipment was being used throughout the Bureau and at, in D.C. and at the, uh, the field stations in order to find ways to subject uh, uh, equipment like engines and also developing um, navigational instruments for planes and another emerging technology, submarines, to duplicate 
high altitude, low altitude, underwater conditions. Planes and submarines, along with radio, were prominent examples of newly emerging technologies for which uniform standards of design, as well as operation, were needed. And that's what they were tapping into the nation's laboratory for that. And here's another example of that technology. This is the control panel for the first blind instrument landing equipment. This was uh, developed in the late 1920s, basically by this man, Harry Diamond, who was a bureau, who came to the bureau. He was the son of Russian Jewish immigrants. He earned bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. MIT's name that will turn up a lot as we proceed with this history. He taught electrical engineering at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania before joining MBS in 1927. He was initially started working on the field of air commerce, commercial aviation, which was just getting underway. And in that in area, he developed this radio beacon system, allowed, allowing for the first instrument landings uh, by aircraft without blind landings, in other words. This system would earn, earn Diamond the first of many patents for electronics-related inventions. Harry Diamond, uh, Lyman Briggs, Hugh Dryden were part of a growing pool of scientific talent coming into the Bureau in the years between World Wars I and II. The number of employees had grown to over 1,100 by the end of 1918. That number included over 100 women. Uh, one, among them was Miss Johanna Busey, a researcher in thermometry who in 1929 became the chief of the thermometry section and held that position for 20 years until her retirement. The first woman with a doctoral degree in physics to work at the Bureau arrived in 1918, as well as many others. The Bureau was one of the first agencies that began really to offer, offer important opportunities for this work to women. While the workforce would drop slightly during the Great Depression, there would still be nearly a thousand employees in the Bureau in the fall of 1939, along with the basic divi division, uh, divisions devoted to fields like electricity and chemistry and weights and measures, a number of new specialized sections began to multiply, reflecting the needs of an evolving economy and an evolving strategic situation. War clouds were building in Europe and Asia, and uh, there were scientists, among others, scientists who were being driven out of their home countries by, for example, like Albert Einstein and uh, Enrico Fermi, who left uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Italy to come to America and began talking and urging the other uh, American scientists to be aware of having to develop uh, military technology to be able to resist what the Axis powers were doing. And um, the, the was work that they did overlapped into all sorts of fields. Another uh, person who came in in the early 1930s was an individual named Alan Aston. And there's, this photo here shows him engaged in sending up some uh, weather balloons. Uh, one of the th first things he began uh, doing was uh, work to explore the Earth's conditions in the Earth's upper atmosphere. First, it involved sending balloons up with uh, new instruments to try to measure things like temperatures and other conditions. This, along with instruments in those machines that were engaged in stress testing of building materials, really formed the basis for the beginnings of telemetry, or remote measurement. It evolved out of these instruments. Uh, the work on instrumentation by scientists like Aston, Harry Diamond, and others enabled the development of better standards for construction materials, and better navigational instruments for ships and planes. And as I said, like, if this began with work that was requested by the Weather Bureau, but pretty soon this work, the study of things like radio waves, were beginning to overlap into all kinds of fields. And in studying uh, radio waves, they were laying the foundation, they were beginning to look at things like the, using radio signals to detect approaching ships and aircraft. This was the beginnings of radar. And uh, in the field of radio, one of the things, this is a picture of the quartz crystal lab at the Bureau. This is from the uh, early years of World War II. 
because uh, one of the priorities, quartz crystal, is a naturally occurring mineral formed in the earth under pressure. It happens to have a natural conductivity, an ability to conduct electrical energy, which made it the heart of early radio sets that men call them calling crystal radio sets, amateurs, amateur radio sorts of things. The Bureau Quartz Crystal at that point in time was found only in Brazilian mines. And the Bureau began to develop a facility to test and stockpile quartz crystals brought in from Brazil. And this is also the beginnings of work to find ways of developing synthetic substitutes for quartz crystal, which would eventually uh, be begin, eventually happen over the decades. But in the meantime, the, uh, the experiments with quartz helped to develop, to make radio, turn radio from the uh, model sort of thing for amateurs into an instrument of mass communication and helped to form the basis for the first radio companies, which became the first electronics companies, companies like RCA, Westinghouse. Um, the Bureau's gauge section, I mentioned earlier, had been involved in a lot of munitions work since the First World War. And another thing, because of the Bureau's work in munitions, uh, they became the focus of some British scientists. I mentioned uh, in uh, 1940, just when World War II had begun in Europe, Britain was at war, but the U.S. was still officially neutral. <clears throat> but a delegation of uh, British scientists and military men visited the United States to share some technology that they had developed in the hopes of helping the U.S. Lead, become a part of a coalition against the Axis powers. And one of the things that they presented was a variable time fuse, which was used in artillery shells at that point. Uh, it was a fuse that used radio and radar signals to time an artillery shell to its proximity to a target and set it off when it reached a certain, the signals reached a certain intensity. This is in contrast to the traditional fuse shells, fuses, which had basically gone off one contact or were set to go off at a certain time period just before the shell hit. This was a, a new version, an electronic version. And in response to this, the Bureau created a, uh, a section on fuse research. And it also created a whole new division called Ordnance, on Ordnance Development. Um, the formal U.S. entry into the war in December 1941 led uh, the Bureau to begin to expand further. And it also led to the creation of a, another section within the ordinance called Special Projects. Special Projects basically work, was to work on missiles. The idea of the German V-1 and V-2 attacks against Britain had brought the idea of the missile from the realm of science fiction to the hard reality of a lethal weapon in the early days of the war in Europe. And the Special Projects people began to work on that. And that's where you also see, excuse me a second. We also see, um, again, the, what I call, I refer to it in the book as like a farm system between business and academia, the labs in various corporate labs, and the NBS. And um, it might be better to call it a, a network, networking system, because MIT, which I mentioned earlier, began producing scientists, and they developed a radiation lab, which was involved in research into radar, things like that. And uh, uh, a young man, a number of young men from MIT began working, got themselves lent to NBS in the early 1940s. One was a man named Ralph Lamb, who began to work in the special projects section on the idea of guidance systems for guided missiles, which was like, these guys were literally writing the book. And uh, they began to work on things uh, like uh, ways of guiding missiles. And an example of it, this is the Pelican, which was one of the early prototypes of a missile produced out of uh, the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, the Pelican, you see in, in 
there's oral, oral history interviews with some of these guys years later that are mentioned in the book, and they would take to referring to them. They called them by bird names, and they took to referring to rockets as birds, and sometimes planes too. Well, probably this bird was the landing gear to, you know, that sort of thing. But uh, Lamb came over as a visiting physicist, and another man who joined him from MIT was a young man named Fred Alpers, who came over and uh, began to work in the special projects section. And there's a, an excerpt from an oral history in the book. It goes into more detail in the book, but Alpers talks about how the fact, like this missile, the prototype model was made of plywood because of a wartime shortage of aluminum in the country. And Alpers says there were several companies that made jukeboxes, and they were called upon to make these missile prototypes because they were good at making curved surfaces with plywood. And uh, the Pelican grew out of an earlier project called the Robin. And the interesting thing about the Robin was that uh, it utilized assist its original guidance system was a TV camera. They had started to develop television. And the idea was a pilot would carry this missile, he would launch it, and he would look and see a TV camera by which he was seeing what the missile was seeing. Uh, unfortunately, this, as, as Alvarez and others testified, this system didn't work out because of interference. <laughs> it was the early remote control, but it was a problem that the vibrations of the rocket caused the camera not to function. So they began to develop, like for Pelican, a more sophisticated radar system. I should add, these, again, this technology was so new. These missiles, at this point, had no propulsion systems. They were known as glide bombs. Basically, a plane would carry it aloft at a certain distance from a target, like a ship, would release it and utilize a radio-controlled system to steer the um, uh, elevons on the leading edges of the wings. The rudders were stationary. They were stiff, but the elevons on the, on the trailing edges of the wings would be manipulated to steer the thing until it reached its target. Isn't that hanging upside down? Pardon me? Isn't that hanging upside down? No. No, okay. no that's... Uh, it's it's so I know, it looked a little... When I first saw it, I had a small. Yeah. But, um, so the Robin evolved into the Pelican. Uh, the Pelican utilized a radar receiver, a little radar receiver, and here we see the miniaturization beginning to come into play. Part of it is an, an example of the experimentation of work like the NBS scientists and scientists elsewhere. And um, use a radar receiver to hone in on radio signals being transmitted from a ship. In other words, if the ship was communicating with somebody, that this receiver in the missile could pick it up and would hone in on that signal. Uh, the Pelican soon evolved into the bat. Here's a picture of the bat, close-up picture of the bat missile, and here it is underneath a, uh, a, a dive bomber uh, positioned uh, for launch. The bat's more advanced system included a radar transmitter to send signals as well as a receiver. In other words, the bat sent out signals to bounce off a target, just like a bat does. That's basically why they called it the bat. And uh, it sent out impulses and followed the echo. The evolution from Robin to Pelican to Bat reflected a collaborative model that had long been used at NBS with scientists from various bureau divisions cooperating on different aspects. For example, uh, Ralph Lamb, in an interview he gave, talk he gave years later to a group called the Missile Technology Historical Association. Thankfully, they, some of these older scientists organized these associations to remember this work. He referred to uh, people like um, Dr. and we'll see some pictures of these people. Dr. Harold Scramstead, a brilliant systems analyst who, in my estimation, was the very first systems analyst on missile systems. And an aerodynamic engineer named Hunter Boyd, who could look at a drawing of an airfoil, a, a wing for to use in a wind tunnel, and tell you what its flight characteristics would be. And the, the leader of the team on the bat was Dr. Hugh Dryden, who you saw earlier. The expert in inspiration who really kept things going. What's interesting is that Lamb didn't talk, he sort of downplayed his own role 
He was one of the people who was developing, helping to develop the guidance system for the bat, along with his fellow former MIT alumnus, Fred Albers. And because it was a weapon with a warhead, it needed a fuse. And the fuse team, led by Alan Aston and Harry Diamond, were working on improving fuse technology to allow the bat to find its target. And this is an example, interesting, I show this. These are some workers at a factory with our, uh, artillery shells installing fuses, proximity fuses on artillery shells. And this is a picture of Harry Diamond and another associate from NBS, uh, Dr. Ellett, who had another scientist who originally was loaned from another department and started to work on fuse technology. And I, I use this photo, it's in the book. He's holding one of the fuses here. Now you look at that, I, I, I show that to point out the fact that you're talking about this object like that's so big, which basically contains radi uh, radar transmitters and receivers within it. It's, it's still amazing, even to me, that, um, that these things can uh, function. But that's an example of how fuse technology had advanced. This is an example of the uh, Proximity Fuse Model Shop, where uh, proximity uh, test models as well as early production models of the fuses would be made. This is at NBS in Washington. And uh, as we found out, this picture appears in the textbook me uh, Measures of Progress. But we found out from talking to Everett that this particular individual here is a woman named Ruth Callamon, who came to work at MBS in the late 1930s as a physicist after getting her degree in physics from Oberlin College, another example of the many women that were employed by the agency. She would work in physicist, as a physicist and later in technical publications for MBS for a couple of decades. She would also marry a fellow physicist, Everett Ireland, and uh, they would work together on aspects of uh, national defense. This is a photo of the bat development team. I think this is with one of the missiles before a, a launch. This is the bat suspended beneath a PBY patrol plane. The final working model of the bat, it was uh, 12 feet long, 10 feet wide, carried a warhead of 1,000 pounds of explosive. It was designed to be carried aloft under the wing of an airplane and be released at 15 to 20,000 feet in altitude had a glide range of 15 to 20 miles to reach its target. From the start to the deployment of the BAT missile took less than two years, which was the kind of thing that MBS became very adept at, getting things, which is pretty good for missile technology in those days and even in, in uh, these days. In April 19th, oh, let me just uh, point out some people here. This is, um, this is Dr. Scranstead whom you heard uh, Ralph Liam talk about earlier as being one of the first systems analysts. He was also not a big piano player. Uh, I mentioned that because uh, in one of his talks also, Lamb said that when they were in the testing process um, down in, in the woods in New Jersey, they were or off the coast of Massachusetts, there were uh, prototype missiles being tested off of airplanes, and these scientists were in the planes watching, and then when they got back down on the ground, they would have like a session to unwind, and uh, Harold Scramstead would lead song fests, pounding away the piano. Um, let's see, RC. Some of these, these, uh, the crap, these gentlemen are Army and Navy liaison officers working with the BAT program. This is Dr. Hugh Dryden. This is uh, Mr. Boyd, the uh, aerodynamics engineer, and this is Ralph Lamb. And um, in April of 1945, when war was still on in the Pacific, BAT missiles were deployed against Japanese shipping and land targets mounted on the wings of Navy Consolidated Patrol planes. On May the 27th, 1945, a Navy uh, squadron, patrol squadron out of the base in Okinawa launched a BAT missile against the Japanese destroyer. The missile blew off the bow of the ship and it sank within minutes. Three days later, planes from the same squadron used bat missiles to sink 
two more ships and damaged 13 others. As a report written years later by the Missile Technology Historical Association put it, the first smart weapons had arrived. And they arrived because of the National Bureau of Standards, essentially. In, uh, and that also, I should add, it employed things in its design um, which were continued to be used. Uh, Ralph Lamb talked about the fact that the use of what they called Elevon steering exclusively and a, and a stationary uh, a rudder and tail assemblies were argued against by some of the aircraft manufacturers and some of the military people who said this wouldn't work. But uh, he and Hugh Dryden and others kept lobbying for it and it was used and it was so effective that it would continue to be used up to the space shuttle. The idea of Elon steering and stationary it was still used in the space shuttle in the 1960s. Um, I should also point out that Hugh, Hugh Dryden ultimately would become, uh, he would leave NBS in the late 40s to become a part of the na a new body, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, or NACA. This would subsequently evolve into NASA, and he would lead it as NASA and help lead it into the space program in the early, in the early 1960s. Less than two months after the surrender of Japan and in World War II, the Navy assigned NBS to develop a new family of missiles based on the BAT technology under the code name of Kingfisher. These were to be, this again, was improvements in the technology and it would also, among other things, improve, it would lead to, uh, oh, first, yeah. From 1946, this is a, from uh, Ralph Lamb's talk, from 1946 to 1950, we not only created the petrol missile, and acted as advisor on puffin and greed programs, more birds, we advanced the state-of-the-art in missile design and technology considerably. And one example of that, he mentions the petrol. This is the petrol, which was developed in that period. And the petrol, in addition to Elevon steering and guidance systems elaborating on what the bat had, it had its own propulsion system, a small turbojet engine which had been developed by the Fairchild Aircraft Company in association, worked with NBS, the first small jet engine ever produced. It also had a small windmill-driven motor generator, which when the missile was released from the airplane, the force of the wind would start up the engine and power the steering mechanism. Just incredible to think of. That engine, Ralph Lane would say years later, was one of Jack Rabinow's contribution. And this is uh, Jacob Jack Rabinow. Uh, he was an electrical engineer who joined NBS in 1938 as an assistant mechanical engineer. Became an important contributor to the fuse and missile programs, obviously creating that jet engine. He, but he also, among the 230 patents he was awarded in his decades-long career, were devices for the automatic regulations of a regulation of clocks and, and watches in automobiles, and a mail sorting machine, which was used by the post office uh, as late as 2016. And I think variations of the technology are still being used, and that's owed to him. Um, here we have Edward Condon. Edward Condon took over as director of HBS in 1945 from Dr. Lyman Briggs, who had become a director. Anyway, um, he was a former a professor at Princeton University where he worked in collaboration with other physicists to develop theories on the motion of atoms. He also, from 1937 to 1945, was an associate director of research at Westinghouse Electric where he helped organize uh, the, uh, nu a nuclear research program. So he worked both in theoretical studies of atoms as well as the practical uses of nuclear energy. During that same period, he helped organize the radiation lab at MIT and worked with other people like Lamb and Alpers and helped to bring in his fellow teammates from that. And they would join him on the bureau staff. Uh, by the, uh, and um, one of the things that began to happen, the dawn of the atomic age and the Cold War accelerated concern among government officials about dispensing military facilities outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, the outbreak of the Korean War 
the Truman administration's decision to develop a hydrogen bomb intensified concerns about MBS and other defense facilities being in Washington, being easy targets. So Bureau Director Condon instructed Land, the Missile Group, and others to try to find other locations. One of the areas they began to look at was Southern California. Here are two, two examples of facilities, the China Lake Airfield and the uh, India Current Naval Ordnance Test Station, which were among facilities which had begun to spring up in Southern California during World War II. They started out as airfields and then they evolved into facilities. And um, this was also became, because of the movement of these facilities and also because of the weather, it also, Southern California became an important location for the aircraft industry. Facilities, companies like Lockheed and Douglas were located in the Los Angeles area. And Fred Albers has noted how they, that this stimulated their interest. He thought about, he talks about, they were either thinking of moving to Florida, where there was a big air base, or to Southern California. Eventually, they also heard about some surplus government property, which had become available in an area called Corona, California. Here's a note from the paper in 1950 concerning a former naval hospital in uh, Corona, California. Uh, there's a, an extended history about Corona in the book. I'll just go into it uh, briefly. But uh, Corona had been at the and originally uh, an agricultural, basically an agricultural area. In the 1920s, the area was like to bill itself as the lemon capital of the world. Very extensive citrus uh, operations going on. But then uh, various land and town companies began to try to develop it. In the 1920s, a man by the name of Rex Clark uh, had an idea to develop a farming village. He created a company called the North Corona Land Company or Norco for short, and um, he began to make plans to build a farming village to s better service the farmers in the area, until around 1925, when they were digging uh, for the water supply, wells for the water supply, they discovered a, um, a uh, hot springs, and Mr. Clark had a change of mind and decided, let's build a resort. <laughs> and on there, on 676 acres, he created a 60-acre artificial lake, which we called Lake Norconian. Norco, get it? <laughs> Norco, at that point, was not an independent city. It wouldn't become one until 1960. It was still on the northern edge of the town of Corona. He uh, built a five-story hotel, a golf course, Olympic swing pool, a hot sulfur spring spa, a gambling casino, and an airport. The casino was in a pavilion right on the edge of Lake Norconian. The hotel was on a bluff overlooking it. He hired an architect to build the buildings in the Spanish colonial style. He hired a top pro to lay out the golf course. Lake Marconian uh, Resort, um, 1,000 guests turned out for the opening. Clark had some connections in finance in Hollywood. He was married to an heiress to the Scripps newspaper fortune. And he had some connections, as I said, in Hollywood. So a thousand guests turned out for the opening of the Lake Marconian Club in February of 1929. Unfortunately, his timing was a little off because a few months later the stock market crashed and the Great Depression came in. Um, the Marconian Resort was never able to recoup its costs. Uh, Clark put it up for sale in 1933, but he was never able to find a buyer. The resort had closed its doors in 1940, but at that point, it began to attract the attention of the U.S. government, which was anticipating seeing the war clouds. The U.S. was still officially neutral, but they still saw themselves as the need for expansion of various government facilities. And uh, they began negotiating with Clark for, to buy the Marconian property, which they did uh, just a few days after Pearl Harbor, in 1941, to, and they bought the property to create a U.S. Naval Hospital. This is the beginning of what became known for decades as Naval Hospital Corona, shown here in the San Diego State University uh, photo collection. Naval Hospital Corona would become an important facility in the Pacific Theater in World War II. It would also become a center for the treatment of tuberculosis, polio, and cord bladder issues, 
in the general population. Its original doctor, uh, Ivan Stamp, was originally pulled from the Mayo Clinic and began to develop and had a really good reputation. After 1946, the patient load dropped off to the point where in 1949, the hospital was decommissioned. But there was talk about, once the Korean War had broken out, there was talk about re-establishing it. And uh, back and forth began to go on between the government and MBS about possibly using part of the site for a new corona laboratory. At the same time, Cold War pressures were involved having their effect on other aspects of the lab. This is Dr. Condit, MBS director, sitting in the audience for a session of the House Un-American Activities Committee in March of 1948. He was called to testify because the chairman of the Un-American Activities Committee described Dr. Condit as the weakest link in our atomic security. I guess because he had some friends who happened to be, I don't know, a little more leftist yeah, ideas or whatever. Yeah. But I should add that there was no basis for the QX charges the Truman administration defended Condon, and it just sort of blew over, but it was a sort of a cloud that would hang over him uh, for some time. And um, Cold War tensions were also being evident in the Bureau, in very, there are various aspects of corporate culture between the original Bureau, the standards people, what some people call the test tube guys, and the uh, military research guys. There were different sources of funding, the standards people got their funding directly from government appropriations. The military people got theirs from funds transferred from the various services. There was a lot of some power games going on. But uh, eventually, the U.S. Navy officially assigned space to the National Bureau of Standards at the hospital. And it so happened that the NBS Corona Laboratory and the recommissioned Naval Hospital Corona officially created within 12 days of each other in February of 1951. Um, it's interesting when uh, you see how this uh, turned out. So one of the areas that there were, there were a number of buildings from the resort and that the, from the hospital that the lab was able to utilize while the hospital continued to function. One of them was the former tubercular ward. And I mention this because Everett told a story about when he first reported, he originally started to work for the Bureau in Washington, D.C. Then the, when the move to Corona was made, he transferred to Corona in, uh, in uh, 1952. And he talked about how his office was in the former tuberculosis ward, which they had used to uh, be used a fish oil-based paint to kill off any bacteria when, in the hospital days. And as a result, as he put it, that place stunk for two years. But Corona had a lot of other uh, things to offer in replace of that odor. Uh, the Spanish colonial style architecture included arched and colonnaded walkways between buildings providing shade from the Southern California heat. Tables along the lake offered relaxing space for workers on break. The former officers club became an ideal setting for happy hours at the end of the workday. There were recreational opportunities nearby, from beach going to desert camping. Hollywood wasn't that far off if you wanted you know, to go. Um, it was a new world for the employees of the lab. And here's some pictures of the setting. This, actually, one of these people, I believe, is Everett, in 1952, standing in front of what had been the hospital building. But, um, and moved to California. Here's a quote from Everett. The new arrivals in California eagerly bought almost all of them up, referring to the housing. He says they were attractive and cheap by Washington standards. And here's Fred Alper saying it was a nice atmosphere down in North Carolina. We didn't have much trouble recruiting compared to a lot of other labs. We had a nice lake there and Spanish style buildings and big rolling hills. And, uh, and Alpers also spoke about the fact that you had a nearby campus at UC Riverside, which became a source of a place where employees could go for, to take classes. They also had seminars back and forth within the context of a very tight, the lab was, uh, had, was behind barbed wire fences because they were doing a lot of classified work. But, um, so 
But there were other controversies. I mentioned earlier the controversy with HUAC. And in August of 1951, just a few months after the creation of the lab, Edward Condit resigned as NBS director, ostensibly to take a job with the Corning Glassworks. But it was also revealed later on that he'd been the subject of an intensive campaign by this man, a man named Jess Ritchie, over a, a product he created called DX2, which was a battery additive designed to prolong the life of batteries. And this is part of the, something from the packaging of ADX2 telling people how to use it. He's shown here demonstrating it for the Senate Select Committee on Small Business. Now, I won't go into the detail, I mean, it, it, the book goes into a little more detail about this. Basically, the Bureau, NBS, the the Bureau had been, because of its work, its electrochemical work, had been in the business of testing and maintaining batteries, originally to have a standard for voltage, originally. And they continued to develop, do battery research and work, and battery manufacturing at one of its field stations from the 1918s on. And its leader, the longtime leader of the electrochemistry division, Dr. Vinal was considered an expert on batteries. And they published a literature you know, in the 1920s and again in the 50s, basically on the subject of battery additives and saying they found no evidence that these substances prolonged battery life. Uh, they tested ADX2 at the request of Mr. Ritchie and came up with the same results. Mr. Ritchie began, then began lobbying, saying that Basically, NBS was trying to drive a small, bit, a small company out of business and were colluding with battery manufacturers. And I should add here that the Better Business Bureau of the United States were among the supporters of NBS's beliefs on, ba on battery additives. They supported the Bureau's decision. The, the um, Oakland, California branch of the Better Business Bureau disagreed. They supported Richie. Richie was based, his business was based in Oakland. He, uh, among other things, initiated a letter writing campaign so that at least 29 U.S. senators and one House member wrote letters protesting the Bureau's behavior. Uh, the gist of it is, in March of 1953, Alan Astin, whom we mentioned earlier, who had taken over as the director of the Bureau after Edward Condon resigned, was called into the office of the Secretary of Commerce, Sinclair Weeks, and told by an assistant secretary, he, he was asked for his resignation. He submitted it because he, he serves at the, you know, at the pleasure of the, uh, you know. And he resigned. This set off a storm within the media, as well as the scientific and academic communities. Literally, newspaper columns across the country protested this interference. The uh, Commerce Secretary tried to say that the, the, he was, this was the new Eisenhower administration which had a more of a small government function perspective. And he talked about the Bureau wasn't considering, quote, the play of the marketplace in its testing uh, procedures. The media uh, storm, which eventually led within, a, within less than a month, the current uh, weeks to reconsider and uh, decide not to fire Aston. He did commence a uh, research, a, a, a probe, there were committee, there were a uh, Senate committee at which Aston testified as well as Ritchie. Um, a lot, some U.S. senators and most government officials took the position in support of NBS. And NBS was basically uh, uh, cleared of the, any of this. And Mr. Ritchie's attempts to uh, uh, bring suits against the government were turned out, right down by the courts. So NBS was vindicated, but in the process, a couple of studies were done by which a decision was made to separate the defense work from the Department of Commerce work. So the laboratories based in the ordnance laboratories, missile laboratories that moved to Corona uh, were put under the Defense Department and eventually under the Department of the Navy. And the facility became Naval Ordnance Laboratory Corona. That's the symbol of it right here. The Naval Ordnance Laboratory, the first commander, Admiral Manville, oh, Captain, Captain F.C. Manville, excuse me. And the Navy's, uh, from, from what the book, uh, the sources uh, told me, the Navy basically 
maintained a low key presence, and Admiral was the, you know, he took the place of the, uh, what had been the Secretary of Commerce, but the, underneath him, technical director of the laboratory continued to be a civilian. And at first, the first technical director was uh, Ralph Lamb. And um, Lamb and others began to do uh, work toward developing the next generations of missiles. And this is one of these young engineers who came into the lab in the mid-50s, originally from the Navy, named Robert Hillier, talked about how, and they talked about, again about some competition between various facilities. Cronin attempted to put more emphasis on the research end of the business and the science end, as opposed to the development end that is prominent at China Lake. He would later move to China Lake, and I use this as an example of sort of the rivalries that develop between the various facilities. But interestingly, there was also in another part of the oral history interview, Hilliard sort of contradicts himself. If there was an exception to that emphasis on the science as opposed to the practical, at Corona, it was the fuse department, which did more developmental work and less basic and applied research. Another, uh, so that's, is, a, is an example of sort of this internal dynamics that were going on. At the, but at, even with the Navy in there, as I said, the Corona Lab maintained its sense of collegiality. Uh, Fred Albert said it was more a college type thing, a college or academic atmosphere down there. Uh, that temper, academic atmosphere was tempered by the classified nature of most of the lab's uh, work. But uh, they were continuing to develop uh, different I missiles. The uh, Naval Ordnance Laboratory was the heart of an operation that created all the major anti-aircraft missiles in the Navy's arsenal. This included what Corona lab workers like to call the three T's, Terrier, Talos, and Tartar. The Terrier was the first ship-based anti-aircraft missile in the Navy. The Talos and the Tartar represented evolved versions of the Terrier used on cruisers and destroyers and eventually on a specially designed class of guided missile frigates. Uh, yeah, here's, this is a Tartar. All three of these missiles had been designed and their prototypes built at Corona. <laughs> Other examples, this is the Sidewinder anti-aircraft missile and the Standard Arm missile. Uh, the Sidewinder was an anti-aircraft missile. It had been um, the design of it was at, done at the Naval Ordnance Test Station in China Lake, but there was an indirect connection in that the uh, project head, William McLean, was a Cor Corona Lab alumnus, and uh, uh, a team at Corona played a leading role in developing the uh, guidance system of the uh, Sidewinder. Standard Arm represented the widening mission of the lab uh, this was an evolution from ship-based anti-aircraft missiles to air-to-air -air missiles, and then in this case, an air-to-ground missile. ARM stands for anti-radiation missile, and what that means, it's targeting radiation coming from a target. What we're basically talking about picking up the radar signals from a um, enemy radar installations, anti-aircraft launching sites, or other land-based targets. And we have a comment from Edward Ireland, we designed, built, tested, and shipped standard arm in 18 months. That was a record for such a program. So, and I should put these missiles, the Sidewinder mark in, came out in the uh, mid-50s, and it, the first use of a missile in combat after World War II was by the Sidewinder during an altercation that went on in 1958 between the People's Republic of China and what we now today call Taiwan. Some fighting broke out over two islands in the Straits of Taiwan that led to clashes between air and naval forces. On September the 24th, 1958, a squadron of um, Taiwanese F-86 Sabre jets encountered a much larger formation of Russian-built MiG-17s. They were using Sidewinder missiles and they shot down four MiGs. And the uh, Chinese, the People's Republic planes took off and uh, it diffused the, uh, the crisis for a number of years and Taiwan and, and the People's Republic uh, 
existed in sort of uneasy peace ever since, but in peace. Um, standard arm and other missiles would be used in Vietnam, and uh, they would play leading roles. I'm going to have to, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, there's a lot of content to this. Excuse me for going on, but I'll just go through. This is from a report. Stan Atchison, who had come from the University of Missouri and then ultimately worked his way up to be the technical director of the lab, uh, published a report in 1968 for, that he gave to the Congress talking about how the lab has developed fuses for all the Navy's tactical missiles now in service, as well as several still in development. These fuses are performing well. There has never been a safety failure, and they carry out satisfactorily the function for which they were designed. The lab had earned a presidential citation as well as commendations for saving money within the Defense Department. But ultimately, uh, the lab fell afoul of debate about uh, Vietnam, and ultimately, uh, budget fights and that sorts of things, which led Vesey and Atchison wrote this report in an effort to prevent the closing of the lab in 1968. He was able, they were able to forestall it for a few years, but ultimately, in June of 1971, the flag was lowered and the Corona lab was decommissioned. And um, sorry, I went on a, a bit, but there was a lot, as I say, to the story. And uh, there's still a lot more, which I hope that other lab alumni in like, things like the National Technology Historical Association can bring more of this out. But um, in the meantime, you can uh, find out more from my book if you wish. And thank you very much for your attention. who designed guidance systems. But then he also helped to develop the fusing system. He lent himself out to them. I mean, he would strictly stick to one particular thing. Interesting. Yeah, if I could add to that, and by the way, this is a great presentation, I really appreciate it. So I'm a docent at the San Diego Space Museum. And uh, to add to that comment about how much missiles an airplane can carry, so they didn't give up on guns when they started adding missiles to jets. So they still had mostly, you know, air to air combat was done by by gunfire, right? But the missiles that came along were kind of not completely accurate in the beginning, but they became accurate as time went on, and they became the de facto way they are. Our guys now fight. It's mostly an air to air battle. Um, the other thing I'll add about the Sidewinder was. Um, a lot of this has to do with radar-guided missiles, which is absolutely true in internal guidance based on radar. But the Sidewinder was a heat-seeking missile, right? So it, it didn't use radar. It, it honed in on, the, on the, 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 the heat that a jet engine in the enemy plane developed and it would hone in on that, so it didn't need radar. Yeah, I remember the Just to add to that. shots of seeing some films of Sidewinders and, and tests literally going up the tailpipe. Right. That's what it was home to. 
and it was pretty amazing technology for the day. Um, and those, the Saigon missile was always, they carried way more than one after a while. And uh, you can always tell, if you've ever seen those F-18s that, uh, that they fly the Blue Angels, mm -hmm. they have those rails on the end of each wing. Those rails are what carry the sidewinders. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And that, Everett paid tribute to a guy named John Mastronero with the uh, Fusion Guidance Teams at Corona. He said he played a big role in the sidewinder. Yeah, by the way, the Navy developed the sidewinder at the Corona net lab. But it's used by all the branches, right? So the Air Force carries okay. it. Um, a, a lot of other nations now carry the Sidewinder. It is the de facto air missile that is still being used. Okay. Well, thank you. Oh, yes. Just curious, what is the National Standard Bureau doing now? Uh, national, uh, national Bureau, it's, it's now known since the 1980s, it was renamed the National Institute for Standards and Technology. Department of the Department of Commerce. As a matter of fact, like um, Alan Aston, when after he was reinstated as director, he stayed there. And the, the, what, who, the guy who was in the technical director of the Corona Lab when the Navy took over, he stayed with. He was a guy named Robert Huntoon, another one of the guys from uh, I think he was from New York University originally. He went stayed with what became NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technology, which still exists today. In Washington or? Washington, yes. Uh, I invite you all to uh, take a look at my book as well as some of my other books on local history. Thank you very much. For <laughs>